As we know, objects are defined with respect to a local coordinate system called the object space. For instance, each vertex in a 3D model has a position that is relative to the object's local coordinates. In a scene that consists of multiple objects, we need to place each object somewhere in the scene relative to other objects. This placement in the game world is the world transformation and it often is a combination of translation, rotation and scaling of the original object. After this transformation, the objects are said to be in world space. When looking at the scene through the camera lens, the objects are perceived as if the camera was in the center of the world. Therefore, we need to express the position and orientation of each object in terms of the camera's coordinate system, which is also known as the view space. Next is the projection transformation, which brings each point in space that's visible to the camera into the normalized device coordinates. This basically compresses everything that the camera sees into a box that has a range between minus 1 and 1 for x and y coordinates and 0 and 1 for the z coordinate. What we see on the xy plane of this box will be scaled by the viewport size and shown on the screen during rasterization. The z values are put in the depth buffer. In this video, I'll explain how to construct view and projection transformation matrices. We start with the view space transformation. When looking at the objects in world space using a camera, which itself has a position within the scene, we can define another coordinate system with the camera at its center. We can then give each object new coordinates with respect to the camera's coordinate system. We can do this by constructing a transform matrix that reverses the camera position and rotation and applying that transformation to each object that's in the scene. Instead of messing with rotations, which is one of the topics in the next video, we can construct this matrix more directly. We can use a linear transformation followed by a translation to get an FN transformation. Affine. Affine transformation. But first, let's do some math. I would like to have a quick refresher on the dot product, cross product, and matrix multiplication, since those are the operations that we are going to use a lot. Luckily, none of it is complicated. Starting with the dot product of two vectors, which is defined as the sum of the products of the corresponding components of the two vectors. This operation is defined for any two vectors as long as both vectors have the same number of dimensions. The result of dot product is always a single number, and that's why it's also called a scalar product. A rather useful property of the dot product is that the resulting number is proportional to the cosine of the angle between the two vectors. Next is the cross product. Contrary to the dot product, this operation is only defined in three dimensions and always results in another vector. The magnitude or length of the resulting vector is proportional to the sine of the angle between the two vectors. A more useful property, however, is the fact that the resulting vector is perpendicular to the plane of the two original vectors. Finally, we have the matrix multiplication, which is only defined for two matrices A and B, if the number of columns in A is the same as the number of rows in B. The resulting matrix always has the number of rows of A and the number of columns of B. Also note that each element in the resulting matrix is a dot product of all rows of matrix A with all columns of matrix B. Moving on to the view transformation matrix, we can use the operations that we just looked at to construct a coordinate system for the camera. To do so, we make use of the fact that we already know the z-axis of the camera's frame, which is simply the direction towards which the camera is looking. Sometimes the convention is that the camera looks in the opposite direction, but in Primal Engine I choose this to be the orientation for the camera. Another axis that we can use is the world up vector, which in general is simply the unit vector pointing in the positive y axis. Using these two vectors, we want to construct three axes that are perpendicular to each other, just like the x, y and z axis that we use in the world coordinate system. We can find a vector that's perpendicular to the plane of camera z axis and the world up vector by calculating the cross product of these vectors. This is the camera's x axis. Next, we need to find the camera y axis, which is perpendicular to camera xz plane. This is done in the same way by taking the cross product of the x and z axis. 
If any of these vectors has a non-unit length, we need to normalize them first. Now that we have these camera axes, we should note that they are vectors within the world coordinate system. For example, camera x-axis has its own x, y, and z components that describe the axis orientation in the world space. The same holds for y and z axis. Now, if we had a point in space with a position that was with respect to these camera axes and camera's position, we could construct a matrix that would give us the position of that point in world space. First, we'll use camera's coordinate system to linearly transform the point to world space, and then we add the camera position to this new point to get the world coordinates of the original point. Mathematically, we use a linear transformation matrix R followed by a translation matrix T. Note that matrices are applied from right to left. We can combine these into a single matrix M, which will transform any point in view space to world space. This is great and all, but hold on, we need to go the other way around. We have positions in world space and we would like to transform them to camera space. This can be done by calculating the inverse of matrix M. However, calculating the inverse of a matrix is a relatively expensive operation, which can be avoided for this case by directly constructing it. To do this, we first need the inverse of our translation matrix. This is easily done by negating each offset. For the linear transformation matrix, we know that it was constructed using the orthogonal unit vectors which form the camera axis. Therefore, this matrix is an orthonormal matrix. Orthonormal and orthogonal matrices can be inverted simply by transposing them. Now that we have both inverse matrices, we can multiply them to get the world to view transformation matrix. Next comes the projection transformation. Strictly speaking, this transformation will take each point from the view space and transform it to the homogeneous clip space. The hardware will further transform these points to the normalized device coordinates. I will explain what I just said later in this video. Let's have a look at NDC space. This is the final place where each point in the camera view will end up. It's a box that has a width and height of 2 and depth of 1. The depth value in Z direction goes from 0 to 1. In our right-handed coordinate system, we need to account for the direction of the Z axis. Now consider the orthographic view space. It's also a box, however, in general it has much larger dimensions. The orthographic projection boils down to fitting the view box into the MDC box. And because of their similar shape, it's easy to see that it can be done using a translation and a scale matrix. Step 1 is to move this box and center its near plane so that it coincides with the front of our NDC box. Step 2 is to divide each side of it by its width, height and depth so it has the same size as the NDC box. Note that I reversed the near and far plane to get a negative depth because of the reverse direction of the z-axis. The last step is to multiply these two matrices to get the orthographic projection matrix. This matrix can be simplified for symmetrical view spaces where translation in x and y direction is not needed. Now let's have a look at the perspective projection. As we saw in the previous video, the view space of a perspective camera is a volume that looks like a capped pyramid called a camera frustum. Similar to orthographic projection, we need to construct a matrix that will fit the frustum in the NDC space. Before doing so, let's examine a few properties that we need for perspective projection. Here the positive y-axis is pointing up and the camera is looking down towards the negative z-axis. Every point in frustum's volume will be projected onto the projection plane. The projection plane will be mapped to the screen and therefore, in general, it has the same aspect ratio as the viewing window or screen. The exact pixel size of it is not important here, since it's going to use normalized device coordinates. So we can choose the height of it to our convenience. If we choose a height of 2, it will have the same height as the NDC box, and then we only have to rescale it in horizontal direction using the aspect ratio. Another property that's important is the vertical field of view. Looking at the frustum from the side, we see that the projection plane has a distance d from the origin. 
As we'll see later, we can eliminate having to deal with this distance in our equations by using the vertical field of view. We also need to encode the depth value of each point in the first term in a range that goes from 0 to 1. Therefore, we are also going to need the near plane and far plane values. To sum everything up, the only properties that we need are the aspect ratio of the projection plane, the vertical field of view, and the near and far plane distances. Let's start with the X and Y projection. Consider a point P within the camera frustum given by its X, Y, and Z coordinates. The projection of P is a point P prime on the two-dimensional projection plane with coordinates X prime and Y prime. The encoded depth value is put into Z prime. The X and Y projection is rather easy using similar triangles theorem. We know that the ratio of Z over distance D is the same as the ratio of the points Y coordinate over Y prime. Therefore, y prime equals distance d times y divided by z. We can repeat this for the x coordinate. Note that for all points within the first term, the value of y prime is between minus 1 and 1, whereas the value of x prime is between minus s and s, where s is the aspect ratio of the projection plane. So now all we need is a matrix that will transform x, y, and z coordinates to dx over z, dy over z, and z prime coordinates. It's quite easy to see that it's impossible to have a matrix multiplication that would result in a division by z component. What we can do is to have four dimensional vectors and back up the z value in the last component, also known as the w component. By doing so, we can effectively postpone the division by z. Now we can think of a matrix that will transform a point P to P prime. The x, y, and w components are easy, we just need to multiply with distance d and 1 for z coordinate. The transformed depth, however, is not trivially found. Remember, we are going to divide by z later, so we can't simply put 1 in here, because z divided by z will result in 1 and we lose our depth information. We know that we won't have any contributions from x and y coordinates, so we can have zeros here, but we don't know what these two elements will be yet, so let's say they are a and b. Dividing the resulting vector by z will give us the exact transformation that we were looking for, except we need to figure out what a and b values should be. To do so, we can make use of the fact that z prime should be within 0 and 1. Therefore, when z equals near plane distance, we should get 0, and when z equals far plane distance, we should get 1. These two equations are easily solved to give us a and b. As you can see, both a and b are expressed in terms of near and far plane distances only. As I mentioned, we can also get rid of distance d to the projection plane by using the vertical field of view instead. We are almost there, but we need to do two more adjustments. First, we need to scale the x direction to fit in a range between minus 1 and 1. Dividing by the aspect ratio will do the trick. We also need to flip the sine of z-axis because of our right-handed coordinate system. Putting it all together, we get the final form of perspective transform matrix for right-handed coordinate systems. Note that we are subtracting far field from near field to effectively flip z sign, and the minus 1 here will transform z to minus z. So this matrix will transform our point P to a space that's called the homogeneous clip space. In general, we perform this transformation in the vertex shader, or any shader that processes the geometry vertices. When we pass this vector to the pixel shader, the hardware will be assuming that this position is in homogeneous clip space, and it will divide each component by whatever value is in the w component. This is called the perspective divide. After perspective divide, we are fully transformed to normalized device coordinates. It's worth having a quick examination of each component. The x and y values are divided by z, which makes sense because the farther an object is, the greater its z value and therefore the smaller its x and y coordinates. In other words, farther objects will appear smaller on screen. We can plot the z component as a function of depth. Because only objects that are between the near plane and the far plane are visible to the camera, we are only interested in the behavior of Z within this range. 
As you can see, the depth value is a nonlinear function of z. It's 0 at near plane and 1 at far plane. However, most of the values in this range are used up for the objects nearby the camera. This means that we have less precision available for distinguishing objects that are farther away. We can also visually illustrate this by performing a perspective transformation on this 2D frustum shape. Although not accurate, it's easy to see that half of this range is spent on the first third or so of the scene. This is made worse by the fact that floating point values have the most precision for values around zero, which can result in Z-fighting for far objects that are close to each other. We can reduce this effect by choosing near and far plane distances that are closer to each other. However, that means that we can't get too close to objects in the scene and also can't look very far away. So this range is going to need fine tuning depending on the kind of scene that we are rendering. Another way of dealing with Z fighting is by using reverse depth buffers. We will use reverse depth in Primal Engine in one of the upcoming videos. Let's consider a number A, the inverse of which is another number B, such that A times B or B times A equals 1. B is denoted as A to the power of minus 1, and therefore A times inverse of A or inverse of A times A equals 1. Number 1 is the identity symbol, because multiplying any number by 1 will result in the identical number. For matrices, the identity is denoted by letter i and is a matrix with 1s on its diagonal and zeros everywhere else. Obviously its dimension always matches the dimension of the matrix that we are working with. Similar to a scalar number, multiplying a matrix with its inverse will always result in the identity matrix. When we think of a matrix as a transformation, the inverse of the matrix corresponds to reversing that transformation. For example, the view matrix is the inverse of camera's transform matrix, because we need to reverse camera's position and rotation and apply that reversal to all objects in world space in order to get them to the view space. 